All right, folks, welcome back into our special series on anti-fragility. Really excited about the conversation we are bringing you today. Uh, I had a chat with Jackie Space, somebody I'm a really huge fan of. Um, Jackie's a wonderful person, tremendously accomplished, and a really incredible mother as well. Jackie served as a senior vice president for BMNT for about a decade. This is a national security focused consultancy. She has spent years in the aerospace industry as a whole. She uh, was kind of one of the founding uh, faculty members or directors of Hacking for Defense, a course at Stanford that helped uh, students kind of understand government problems. Uh, that has now expanded to be offered in over 100 universities and on multiple continents. She's got a military history in the Air Force, as I mentioned earlier, a uh, single mother to a, a lovely young woman as well. Uh, who's doing her own great things. And so Jackie's just an awesome person to talk to and sort of learn from. We dug deep into her sort of professional trajectory, some of the difficulties, the failures, the setbacks, and the learnings along the way. And then ultimately what all of that kind of means for the way she thinks about anti-fragility or seeking discomfort or navigating it, as well as how she's tried to help sort of uh, open up those possibilities for her daughter as well. So Jackie's an amazing human, had a great time chatting with her. Here it is. We hope you enjoy our conversation with Jackie Space. Good morning. How you doing? Good. Good. Uh, after this, I like right after we do this, I'm running to jump on a plane to go to Orlando. For what? Uh, for the space conference. So it's like my cool. first time working, really. All right. So Jackie, let's start getting into your background a little bit i think this will be fun um because as i've just introduced you in your bio i've always thought of you as this uh one of my favorite types of humans which is a badass <laughs> human that doesn't think or doesn't know that they're badasses um <laughs> and that's certainly you exemplify that um but you do have a really incredible background and i love it if you just start by just kind of walking us through a little bit of your professional history because i i think that's going to set the stage for a lot of what we'll talk about today in terms of anti-fragility Sure. Um, thanks. That's pretty nice coming from you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I um, I have a, my lo a long background in national security. Um, I started off uh, after high school going to the Air Force Academy. And, um, you know, part of that drive for me was actually pretty selfish at the time. <laughs> um, I, I needed free school. Um, I wanted to get out of Texas and I honestly don't think I had any idea of what I was getting myself into by, by going to the air force. Um, I remember at the time telling my parents like, oh, you know, don't worry about it. There's like, you know, the Persian Gulf war wasn't that bad. Like, you know, there's not going to be a war. And then, <laughs> and then, you know, I graduated like right before nine 11 happened. Mm -hmm. And so, um, that was a real turning point for me because um, I think at the academy, I kind of, I kind of went through it with like, not taking it too seriously, you know, um, just sort of, you know, I felt like I needed the discipline coming from the background that I came from. I had a, I had a pretty chaotic uh, growing up and like, you know, dysfunctional family and, and upbringing. And so I think the military really did appeal to me in a lot of ways because I wanted I wanted some structure and I wanted some discipline, um, and it was really hard. But but I think I I, I never I, I didn't fully take it seriously until nine eleven happened, hmm. and uh, and for me like I, I was actually just stationed at Dover Air Force Base as a second lieutenant, and it was like two weeks you know, brand new as a Air Force officer. And, you know, one of my first details was um, unloading the human remains from the Pentagon. Mm. And so, uh, you know, that that moment, I think, you know, really changed a lot in terms of understanding that this career would would probably be a lot, a lot more um, uh, serious or, or, you know, something that I, that I took seriously than b before. Um, and in fact, then after that, I was, I ended up being one of the first people deployed, um, for the Iraq war. Um, I, uh, was 
was actually sent to a bear base with like three days notice <laughs> um, to go to go get it, you know, the logistics operation uh, started to to help us go into Iraq. And so I was there um, about a month before we declared war. And then I stayed um, for another six months. Hmm. Uh, and it wasn't dangerous, um, but it was it was just very you know, it was, it was really hard. It was very chaotic. Um, we were, it was like, you know, U S plus a bunch of coalition forces, um, you know, doing a lot of sorties in and out of Iraq, um, from the UAE and we were at a, a bear base and, you know, it, 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 yeah, things got kind of real, uh, at that point too, for me, Sure, uh, it was just a whole different experience than, than, what I had sort of trained for. Mm. Um, but then I came back from that and I, and I was pretty, I was pretty jaded, honestly, like by that point, um, after, you know, I, obviously I had my own feelings about our reasons to go. And then, um, after having spent time there and, and sort of seeing, you know, what, um, a cultural, quagmire we were getting ourselves into um i really uh came back pretty cynical and and didn't want to be in the, the military at that point right. um and i just felt like it was going to be a, a massive disaster and it, i mean it was in, in a lot of ways and um and not to take away from you know any of the servicemen and women that went um but i just i started feeling like oh i don't know if like i don't want to go back i don't want to be part of this. Like, this is a, this is a really, that was a really like challenging moment for me in my career. Um, and so I came back to, to Dover, Delaware and I, and I basically asked the air force if I could switch out of my career field, because at that point I was in logistics and I wanted to do something different. And so they sent me to LA, um, where I got to do space acquisitions. And so I get to be part of the the programs here where they um, basically manage and oversee the development of uh, space uh, programs uh, for the military. And that was really cool. Um, I really, th that kind of changed a lot for me because yeah. I, found, I found something that I actually enjoyed. And so um, I think my first time seeing a rocket, I was really excited. I thought it was like really, really cool. And so I ended up going back for my uh, master's degree in systems engineering and then, uh, you know, starting a career basically on the space uh, national security side. And um, anyway, so, I, yeah, I'm kind of rambling. But from that point on, no, it's good. It's good. <laughs> I, I, like I, I, the whole I think from there on is a whole trajectory unto itself. But before we move into that, let me, you know, because I'm obviously jotting down notes here and it just. You mentioned ask kind of asking to switch things up, right, with the Air Force, not feeling sounds like super positive or at least optimistic about what you were seeing and experiencing while in Iraq. But if I pick this up correctly, it was also, you know, some of those moments where you said it raised your level of kind of seriousness about the job itself, right? Um, I, I kind of translated that as there was a lot of meaning and purpose. And what you were, I think, hoping to do, or at sometimes at some points in time doing, right? Um, but as often the case, when we have that sense of purpose, but it's not being executed on or lived out in sort of the way that we might envision or a way that we feel good about, that actually creates a lot of discontent. It's like I've got this nice dream and goal and idea of how I can have an impact over here. And then this like harsher reality over there and the two often just if they don't go hand in hand, it causes us problems. Is that, you know, um, yeah. a, a fairly accurate summary of your experience? Yeah, that's very accurate. I, I don't think I understood it at that conscious level, sure. but, but I just knew, you know, that I mean, th there is a lot about the training that you go through in the military and a lot about um you know, what you learn as far as like, you know, the history and, and, you know, uniform code of military justice and like all, and all these, you know, um, 
ideals around yeah. I think, U.S. defense. And and I, you know, I, I struggled with some of that for sure. Um, especially like in in that case, right? Because, you know, in, it became pretty evident to me like pretty early on that this was going to be a long-term war and that it was potentially going to be intractable. And, mm-hmm. you know, then, then when you start losing friends and people that, you know, and, and, and there's, you know, mm-hmm. like at that point it's, it's, it becomes a, you know, it becomes really, really challenging to, to rectify like all the things that I believed in, you know, in that training. And then, um, you know, being challenged with, with, uh, you know, values issue. And, and again, like, I don't want to, I am very patriotic, you know, I I love my country and there's no, um, you know, I'm very grateful to, to have, to be, have been part of the military and to have gone through that. Um, but, but there was that moment where I was like, I, this is not, I don't want to, you know, especially after I had my daughter, I, I just had a child after that. Um, I, I really didn't want to continue going back. Um, and it's amazing because w- when I was there, I realized too, there was quite, you know, like the amount of parents that were out there, you know, that, that like, cause I wasn't a parent when I went, you know, I don't yeah. think I was, yeah. I was, I was 20 <clears throat> years old. Um, and I had my daughter when I was 26, but you know, at, at that, like, I just had no concept at that time, like of how difficult that must have been for them you know, mm-hmm. to be from your children. And it ha- I mean, the service members, you know, that that's, that's their lived experience, you know, for a full career. Mm-hmm. And so, mm-hmm. um, yeah, you really have to, you, re- I think, I think in order to not get completely, you know, burnt out and, and jaded and cynical, you have to be pretty aligned, I think with the values piece. Well, and so it sounds like, you know, going back to this new trajectory, maybe that's where some of that alignment started coming in, right? So what I, yeah. again, just tracking what I'm hearing so far is purpose and meaning. I'm also hearing um, practice with chaos, uh, both from childhood and from the military and obviously from war. I'm hearing general sort of unpleasantness from like incongruence, we'd call it, misalignment between values and sort of how you're living your life, Right. So you carry all of that in, but then you get into the space field at large things, I think, take a significant change from there. So walk us through that a bit. Sure. Yeah, that that's a that's an interesting way to frame it. But that's true. I mean, yeah, I I I saw I, you know, I I started falling in love with the idea of um, putting things into space. (laughs) I thought it was really cool. Um, And. And I also, it, it was one of those things where I felt like, oh man, I, at that time I was like, man, I really missed out because I did the wrong major at the Air Force Academy. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not able to get into this field this late because I, um, you know, I think at that point I was 26, 27 and, you know, I just felt like I'd missed the boat and I was pretty sad about it. Um, but I, I, I was getting these jobs that were inside of the military that were like working inside of these programs. And I wasn't on the engineering side, but I was, I was like on the logistics side, but I was still touching a lot of the the engineering and, and the program management. And so um, I ended up deciding to leave the air force um, at that point, because I knew that I would continue getting um, deployed. And I would also, you know, be sent to other bases that weren't, you know, space related. Like this was sort of an anomaly. It was like a career, like, oh, you have to go do this for a little bit of time and then you have to go back. And so I didn't want to do that. I wanted to stay and and continue working on, on, on these programs. And so I went to, I got out of the Air Force and then I still didn't really know what I was doing at that point. And I actually, I took some like really random odd jobs and I was like, you know, I worked in Hollywood for a minute as like an executive assistant and I was like a business broker. I, I mean, I did like all these sort of random things. Um, but I realized like I, 
I didn't enjoy any of that. And I wanted to use my, my brain a little bit more. And so I went uh, back to, I went back to a contractor, um, an Air Force space contractor, and they hired me. And then they ended up paying for my master's um, in aerospace system engineering. And so at that point, I was basically, I think by that point, I had like a three-year-old and I was working full-time going to grad school at night. <laughs> um, and, you know, and I really wanted to get my engineering chops, you know, un under my belt uh, because I wanted to be in the room, you know, with you know, in those programs, being able to, you know, um, have a seat at the table, basically. So was that uh, time in your life also chaotic? Yeah. Yeah. Did, in, a, in a similar sort of way or a different sort of chaos? I mean, it, uh, you know, I think anytime. Yeah, I, I was married at the time. Um, and, you know, we just had my daughter. Uh, mm -hmm. and so I think I, I look back on that now and I, I wonder how in the world I did that, honestly. Um, because it was so it, it, like when you have a young child, it's already so much work. I mean, it's, it, it's just, it, it's so hard to describe to somebody who hasn't gone through it, but just the lack of sleep alone for me was was really difficult um, the first couple of years because like my daughter just didn't sleep like she just refused mm. to sleep. <laughs> so, mm. um, and, and she's a great kid. She's eighteen now. She's a great kid. But like at the time, like I I didn't I don't know how people. I think it's what kept me probably from having more children is I, I barely survived her <laughs> the first couple of years. Um, and so then yeah so so doing that then plus um you know like i said working full time and going to school and, and i think there i you know one of the things i realized about being in la because i grew up in texas and then i lived in colorado for school and i was in delaware and um you know when i came to los angeles i remember feeling like so depressed when i looked around because i just didn't understand how there were so many rich people you know, like, like how, how do people live here? <laughs> it's like, it was so, I mean, it was just, so, it was so far beyond my comprehension of, of like money, you know, small town, and, Texas. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I grew up in a suburb of Houston, um, you know, and we were like middle-class, but like, you know, a starter home here where I was living was, you know, like a million dollars. And and to me, that was un unbelievable. And, and I remember we were just like scraping by, you know, just like super scraping by. And it just felt like, you know, because we were, we had, you know, done all these things in the military and then we came here, it was like, we were just starting over and the pressure to work really, really was there. And even mm -hmm. though I wanted to do something that I love, like there was no, I felt like there was just like, you, I just had to work, you know, yeah. And, yeah. like staying home with my daughter. So yeah, that was a really tough time. A lot of stress, a lot of pressure. Did you fall? Your, did you find yourself falling back on some of your air force experience in terms of like discipline, regimentation systems, those sorts of things? Or was it just, you know, were you flying by the seat of your pants or maybe a bit of both? Yeah. I mean, I think that I, the military was good for someone like me because I tend to fly by the seat of my pants. You know, I'm not a naturally regimented, disciplined person. And so I sort of, I sort of thrive under structure and deadlines, um, which I think, you know, like in those environments, like engineering, you know, um, Air Force space, like all those environments that, that works fine. Like that, that's actually not a bad, you know, way to, I think like I, but you know, what I've learned later on is like where I fall apart is when it is when it's, when I don't have that, you know, when I don't yeah. have the pressure of a deadline. So I can throw, I mean, that's, I, that's where I sort of excelled. And I wish I could say, look, looking back that I had these like systems, but I really was just, you know, grinding. Making it work. Okay. Making it yeah. work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like I yeah. remember one time, I remember one time my um I was at work like during the day and I was doing schoolwork like in my cubicle. I was trying to get some schoolwork done for a, a class that night. And my um my like boss 
came in and sort of, you know, popped in and surprised me. You know, obvious I was not doing work. I was doing schoolwork. And she just, you know, let me have it. And I just I remember I just like, I just started bawling, like, you know, which I never like that for me, I, I don't think I've ever cried even, even when I was deployed or, you know, like mm. at Academy, like that moment, I like actually sort of just broke down at work, you know, and I think she didn't even know what to do with me. <laughs> she was <laughs> like, like, do you need a minute? And I was like, yeah, but it was just so like, I was just, I was just on the brink, you know, at that point. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you then finish your master's, right? Where do things go from there? Um, then I then I continued working for a bit um, at the same, you know, at the base on those programs. Um, I also ended up going through divorce um, around that time. And um, then I started to... I started to desire to want to not work for a large company. And so I was trying to figure out at that time, how can I have more flexibility? Because at that time I, I was, you know, at a top secret clearance where I was in a, what they call a skiff all day, which is, um, uh, I, don't even, I don't even know what skiff stands for. It's a military acronym for a special compartmentalized I don't know what the IF actually is. That's where okay. I should do it. But I don't know. Yeah. But, I, but I worked at a skiff all day, which meant that I that I had no access to like telephones. You know, um, you can't bring material in and out. And as a single mom at that point, it was really hard to like be separated just, you know, from my daughter in that way. Like it really bothered me to to not have access to my, I mean, or it was just such a pain to, 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 for just regular communication. And so I was really trying to figure out how could I, um, strike out on my own in a way, like become an independent contractor, um, maybe work from home more so I could, so I could be with my daughter. Um, and so then I started to, uh, I think at that point I left my job and I had taken on some independent, like some contract jobs uh, through the military. And that was a bit of a, um, a stretch for me because I was now working like, I think one of my first jobs, well, I had, I had several, but the one that really became significant was, was I, I I ended up working at the army's, rapid equipping force, um, which was basically the like skunk works of the army. So what they did was they, they took, um, they would take like scientists and engineers and put them at the forward edge of the battlefield. And then they would sort of diagnose problems much more rapidly out there, prototype and and get things fielded to basically okay. save lives at that point, okay. you know? Yep. Um, and so that was a really cool job. And I got to, to work from home and basically I was managing their West, like a hundred million dollars of their West coast portfolio of like all the companies that they wanted to potentially hire. And I was looking at it from a space angle, like how do we bring space to the battlefield? Um, so back then, you know, that was commercial space. The idea of commercial space was really, really new. Um, I think Skybox was was one of the first companies that was actually a venture backed space company that that I was trying to work with to to bring capability into the field. Um, but regardless, it, it was a it was kind of a really pivotal moment in in history because I think what was happening with the war, you know, there was there was you know there is a there's like sort of this inflection point that I think that's happened with with the military in that, you know, for the majority of, of the time that I've been in and, and that, you know, people like, you know, in our, in our recent history, you know, the defense base has created all their own technology. And now with the proliferation of tech, you know, um, being made more rapidly on the commercial side in a lot of cases, um, that has been a real challenge for the military to try to figure out because, you know, we still have a trillion dollar budget and then 
yet we're behind in a lot of the technology that we're developing. Um, and, and I mean, you can see it now, you know, it's like on the Ukraine, you know, battlefield. And, and I mean, it's just become this huge, huge challenge. And so that, that became really evident to me that that was becoming, a, a that would be a major problem. Okay. And especially like, you know, with, with Elon Musk and SpaceX, like, you know, I, I remember I was in the rooms in the Air Force when the Air Force was trying to not allow him to compete, you know, against ULA. And I just, you know, I thought, oh, my God, like if if there's this like South African that's like building rockets, I mean, every piece of technology that the government has ever developed is going to be now, you know, um, available commercially Um International. I mean, it, it, it's a it's a complete Big ripple effects. Yeah, yeah, huge, massive culture effects um, that I think the military is really grappling with. And so that job at, in the army, sort of, you know, I think really woke me up to that. I was in, in, like I said, I was working from home, but the guy that was running the army's rapid equipping force, Pete Knoll, he um, he uh, decided to retire. And when he was driving sort of cross country, like to California, you know, I called him up and I was like, Hey, you know, what are you doing next? And he's like, well, I'm going to go start this company in Silicon Valley. Um, and we're going to continue the work that we were doing here at the army's rapid equipping force. Yeah. And I was like, great, uh, let me help. I want to help. And that's how we then started, um, BMNT, which is the company that I co-founded I guess 10 years ago now. Right. Um, and that was, you know, I, I had no idea at that, t- at that point in time, like how much of, of a tiger by its tail <laughs> we, were, we were getting ourselves involved into. Um, so, you know, in a, a lot of ways it was great because I got to sort of break out from, you know, I didn't, I didn't, I no longer had a nine to five, um, mm-hmm. a corporate job and I could work from home and I could be flexible, you know, now with being a single parent and, uh, you know, there was just a lot, there was a lot of freedom in that. Um, and I think, you know, what, what I didn't realize at that time was, you know, with everything, there's always like a trade off. Right. And in the case with the startup, and with trying to build a company, um, it's incredibly consuming. Um, it basically, you know, in many ways, it took took over my life um, because it just it's like we just hit the ground running, and you know, from that from that moment, like it just it was a very frenetic um, pace, and I was on a plane a, a lot. Did you um, love it at the start? It, yeah, it was awesome. It was really like, it was so fun, you know, Um, it was like terrifying at the time because what we were trying to do is we wanted to basically help bridge the gap between, you know, new innovative technology and, and government programs. And we wanted to take what they were doing at the army's rapid equipping force and bring it across all the agencies Um, and, and some of the thinking and how they diagnose problems quicker um, you know, get to the right problem before you start spending money on technology. Like how do you rapidly iterate? Um, you know, how do you write better RFPs that make more sense and more in line with the technology environment? Mm-hmm. And so we really wanted to educate the government in, in that process. And um, yeah, it was it was awesome. But when we started, like nobody was really talking about that. Um, it was just a couple of us kind of banging around in Silicon Valley uh, in Palo Alto. And then gosh, like, you know, we, since then, I mean, it's, it's, it's the whole environment, at least in my industry is like really exploded. Um, so we were sort of there at the forefront of that and it it was a really, really cool time. And that's about a decade ago, right? So you build up, you build up the company, right? You're doing all these sort of amazing projects, but included in that, I also want you to talk about, you know, kind of the development of, of your own curriculum. So when we were in Palo Alto, um, we started trying to understand kind of like how does Silicon Valley work, you know, and, and what, what makes it so special. 
And so we were there for about a year, um, you know, talking to various people and my partner, Pete, um, and my other partner, Joe Felter, who, who was at Stanford at the time, they had run into a guy named Steve Blank, who, um, basically is considered like the godfather of entrepreneurship. And he developed and wrote books around the lean startup theory, which he teaches at Stanford. So, okay. um, okay. very synonymous with entrepreneurship and sure. sort of a big deal, um, in that community. He's a billionaire. He had, you know, eight failures, then became rich and sort of, and, and then used that method to write about that and teach other entrepreneurs. Okay. And you know, he's responsible. I mean, he's done an, an amazing amount of, of work for entrepreneurship and, and other causes too. But he was teaching at Stanford and he saw what we were trying to do. And he also had an, an interest in national security. He's very patriotic. He was a veteran um, at uh, from the Vietnam War. And so, you know, he come to us to, you know, to my partners really and said, how, why don't you take my curriculum uh, from Lean Startup and Entrepreneurship course, and instead of trying to find um, product market fit, why don't you use it for government problems to find problem solution fit? And so it's kind of a wild idea, honestly. <laughs> it's pretty wild at the time. And I, because it just, you know, and, and I actually, I mean, for me personally, I was kind of cynical around the idea because I didn't, I didn't want to necessarily be in the classroom and I, and I wanted to be more on the tech side. Um, and I think, you know, I was quite wrong in, in that case. If, if I may, I mean, I, you know, and obviously we've had these conversations before, but I'm hearing some, you know, I think more details I haven't heard before. And like, the thought that just occurred to me is that feels like a full circle moment in some ways, because it it seemed like the reason you wanted out of Iraq and out of the Air Force, it, it, you correct me if I'm wrong, was not only a lot of problems were occurring, but then I have to presume there was an inability to identify those problems and remedy them quickly. And I guess I'm just wondering if this maybe in retrospect gave you an outlet to kind of tackle some of those things that that pushed you in this direction initially yeah i mean right it, i i think i was being short-sighted at that point mm -hmm. like when i because i i kind of saw it like in my mind i was trying to build a company that would grow and survive and so we had very um we were this taking like a distraction yeah, we were taking the problem centric yeah. approach of of what we were doing, and you know we were running hard with that with 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 trying to get customers and trying to like work inside of programs, and so that's where my head was at. So the so the curriculum in the in the classroom, I was like, oh my gosh, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know about this. Um, but I started sitting in on on the entrepreneurship courses and lean, lean launchpad, and honestly, it was amazing. Um, you have these like incredibly smart. Stanford kids who um, are just getting their asses handed to them because um, and it, it, it's the same it's the same thing that we see with with which I'll get to with, with our our course but but basically you know these kids have this great idea that they want to bring you know go, they want to go make a company around they want to go um, you know bring it to market or develop the next new technology or whatever it is. And what's the beauty of the course, which is amazing, is that they have to present like the hypothesis of their product, and then they have to go out and interview 10 customers. And then they come back with that data, and they're using basically a framework, um, the business model canvas, to sort of invalidate their data, but it's all customer-driven. like driven. Sure. And, and the idea was that, you know, yeah, you have a great idea, but, you know, your business plan is as good as, you know, as soon as you get punched in the face, like the first time, I think there's some quote, I think it was Mike Tyson, but anyway, <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, so I mean, these kids would just get hammered and, but, you know, at the end of the course, what they had to present, you know, was honestly amazing. You know, it wasn't these, just these half-baked ideas. They were like, you know, very, very driven in, in data and like, you know, good interviews and discovery 
And I think that's that's something that, you know, that principle really did and you know, change my outlook on how to like develop companies, how to develop new technology, how to, you know, it really like the idea around discovery, which is something that a lot of people don't want to do. You know, you, you once you have an idea and you have a, a thing that you want to go do, you want to just go hit the ground running. But the the element of discovery, I think, is what can can really you know be the difference between a successful venture or not. And so then, you know, with that idea, I ended up, you know, we decided to to help put this course together called Hacking for Defense. And the idea was that we would take that same methodology and the students would present a like hypothesis around the solution to a government problem. But then they would have to go out every week and interview, um, you know, 10 people around the problem. Mm-hmm. And the problem you know, the interviews could be people inside the agency. It could be the agency's like, quote unquote, customers, like who they're supposed to be delivering to, you know, on the operational side, on the acquisition side, you know, on the contract side, like all the people that have to touch, you know, a program, um, those students were out there interviewing. And so they would come back, you know, after, so for example, like, you know, there was a, there was an example of like, you know, a, a case where like the, these like Navy divers were getting lost underwater. So of course the students went right in with wanting to, you know, develop like this really cool, like wearable technology. And when they got in and they were like all about it. And then when they got like halfway through the course, you know, like after talking to multiple divers, the divers were like, we won't fucking wear that because we don't want our like biometrics being reported back to, you know, doctors and anybody like they, they were so resistant to putting any sort of wearables on and it it became all you know it was like a great idea but then they ended up coming up with this other solution that i think ended up getting funding later but where they were you know where they were able to sort of deploy these um these like sensors on the water and it was like lightweight right. you know it was right. like yeah it was a totally different tack you know and and what we ended up seeing over and over well the first course um i think was really illuminating in the sense that one, I didn't think that Stanford students would be that excited about government problems, especially because right. we had like, I think we had like the NSA in there, you know, there was the Air Force. I mean, they had, um, you know, I, I really thought it would be, they'd be pretty resistant to that. And I think what it showed was there was just a lot more understanding between the two worlds by the end of it. Sure, sure. Hi friends, Nick here with just a brief interlude to share with you an update on one of our newest partnerships with the Anti-Fragile Academy. Throughout John and I's conversations with many, if not most of our guests, one thing has been made really clear. In order for people to flourish, thrive, experience the good life, they need to develop the capacity to not only navigate and endure, but ideally grow from the bad, grow from unpleasant experiences. That's why we're thrilled to be partnering with our newest sponsor, the Anti-Fragile Academy, an organization that I co-founded with Dr. Adam Wright, Director of Mental Performance for the Washington Nationals. At the Anti-Fragile Academy, we work with adolescent athletes, executives, and educators to help them understand some of the science, not just of optimal performance, but of well-being and anti-fragility. The ability not only to endure and bounce back from unpleasantness, but to actually come back stronger, to grow from it. Between Adam and I, we've worked with Fortune 100 companies, Inc. 300 executives, Division I programs, and elite professional athletes and Olympians from all over the world. To find out more about how you can leverage anti-fragility training, check out our website at theantifragileacademy.com. I want to like just skip us ahead here just for a second because I think it, it, you know, in some ways selling yourself short a little bit, but it ended up being, I think, quite interesting and quite popular. And I want to, I want to kind of put a bookend on some of the historical pieces here, but just tell, tell the audience like where the course is at now. Oh, well, that ended up going into like a hundred universities. We have a program in in the UK 
Um, it was federally funded. It is still federally funded program. Um, yeah, it's it's uh, now. I mean, there's been you know hundreds, I think thousands of students that have touched government problems. You know, hundreds of programs that have been funded in some way. Companies that have been started. It's been a really cool. So it was a really really cool journey. You know, in that regard. Yeah. And then and then behind that, my company then ended up growing quite a bit. You know, we we went from a small team to, I think at one point we were like a hundred people mm-hmm. in four different offices. And so that, that it was, it was quite the journey. Yeah, it was quite the journey. Perfect. Right. And it's, and I could see the humility again, cause you had trouble even looking at me when you were talking good about your course there, <laughs> <laughs> which is great. And, and just anyone watching instead of listening, I wish you could have seen it. But, um, so I just want to like summarize here though. Uh, and this yeah. is why I introduced you the way I did. Um, so we went, right, left home, Air Force, war vet, mother, soon single mother, master's degree, space engineering, entrepreneur in Silicon Valley, built up this huge company, over 100 people, right? We, uh, we you know, leave the financials elsewhere, but su- suffice to say, highly successful. And oh, by the way, also helped develop a curriculum that's in a hundred universities and multiple continents. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Quite the journey, I would say. <laughs> okay. Um, and I wanted you to walk us through all of it because I think it's really incredible, but it also, um, I think teases out some of the things we're, I think, hearing from other guests. And so here's where I want us to like take a little turn and try to dig into, I think, what you've learned and pulled out of these experiences. Okay. And I want to start that by at least just planting some seeds here, because what I think I heard throughout this, you can correct any of this as it's wrong, if it's wrong, a lot, like, candidly, a lot of unpleasantness. Um, yeah. you, you mentioned chaos a bunch of times. You mentioned incongruence with values. Um, I think I heard maybe some regret in there. I heard you actively, consciously taking on like really hard shit and challenges to like push yourself and grow a lot of stress and pressure, um, especially, you know, when your daughter's born and you're thinking about working and, and obviously as that comes with being a single mom, um, I hear failure, I hear critical feedback, I hear uncertainty. And the reason I'm just pointing all of that out is in, I guess what I want to ask is, do you feel like you have been successful and your life is, I think you would say, in a good place despite all of that unpleasantness or because of it? Uh, maybe maybe some of both, maybe somewhere in between. That's a good question. I mean, it's a, I think the term successful is an interesting term. You know, um, I mean, there's, there's definitely various measures of how you're a successful human. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I, I know the accolades and the achievements, but I think, I think the, um, the experiences of failure and pain ended up making me a better person over Mm. time. Um, so, so I think, you know, yeah, I mean, there's almost my, there's a gym that I go to where they talk about failing better. (laughs) It's called gate 14. They're great. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I think, I think there was like, there, you know, there's a lot, it felt like for a long time, like I wasn't successful, um, you know, taking on some of that stuff. And I think that that is my own neuroses that I've had, you know, that we've talked about, but, but as far as like, like when I look at myself now, like I, I just think I'm a, I'm a better person than, you know, where I was 10 years ago, 15 years ago, just in terms of um, how I how I treat myself and how I treat other people and how I look at, you know, these, like, like how, how I start looking at my goals now, it's just, it's just different than it was back then. What's different. I think in a lot of ways um, for a long time, this is where this starts getting personal. I mean, I, I didn't understand my own drive. Hmm. I, I just knew I had it and I wanted to, I just wanted to make it, you know, like I just, I wanted to really escape my circumstances. 
And that was like really driving me for a long time, almost to an unhealthy, like it was unhealthy. It wasn't healthy. Um, I think there is a place where people can use work as like a dis like a an escape in a lot of ways. And so, you know, if I think about the balance in my life, like there was no balance. And I don't know that, I mean, I, I still, you know, I don't know that anyone can truly like have like real balance and like, you know, do really hard things. But I think there is a way to do it to where it's not just completely um, depleting yourself in the process. So everything I mentioned earlier, right, that you, and I think you're saying you've grown from, whether you want to say those things led to you being a better person or those things helped you be successful, I, I think that's a both and, successful and a good person, right? Um, and at the same time, so like we can sit here and talk about anti-fragility and acknowledge like, all right, there's some unpleasant stuff that seemed to like really help you and sharpen you and wield you. And at the same time, what you're bringing up here is there was a breaking point for you. Yeah. And there is for everybody, by the way, right? We just happen to be starting to get into yours a little bit. So maybe you want to take us there. Let's see. It was 2021. And, um, you know, we're in the throes of COVID, um, which I think, so So prior to COVID, um, you know, I was on a plane between Palo Alto, DC, and London, like all the time. And it was frenetic and just exhausting. And then COVID hits and, um, you know, being home and like all the uncertainty with that was like, was really challenging for me, honestly. Um, Cause I, I was forced to sort of slow down. And then during that time, my, my father got, uh, st- he got diagnosed with stage four cancer and, it was pretty quick. I I went home to basically take care of him um, until he passed, which was like four weeks after diagnosis. And I really thought like, oh, I'm fine. Like I, I felt like I, I was like, I'm doing remarkably well, like handling his death. <laughs> um, and then like between that and I was going through kind of like a bad relationship, like a breakup. I I then just I kind of I kind of just lost it. Like I just it was like a, over a couple of periods of like months after my dad's death and I was I just found myself in this position where I had no drive, like none whatsoever. I didn't care about almost anything. Um I was sleeping all the time. Or, I mean, I just had like, you know, like looking back on it, like I know I was probably like full blown depression. Um, but I didn't, but it just, I didn't understand it. And it was really terrifying for me and in that moment. And because I just didn't know what to do with that. And so, um, that is when I decided, you know, and I was very, I was, I'm so lucky. I was so fortunate in a lot of ways because, you know, at that time my company had gotten to a certain level of of success. Um, you know, we weren't in the startup stages anymore that require, I mean, you know, my daughter was a bit older, you know, she was a teenager at this point. I mean, there was a lot of ways that I was able to sort of hide this and, um, I feel very like, you know, I understand. And, and I also knew at that time that I didn't want to take, um, prescription drugs to try to get out of it. And I don't think it's bad for people to do that. I I totally understand it. Um, but for me at that point, I just, I wanted to understand what was causing that and, and why, and like how to fix it. Like, yeah, yeah. which <laughs> which ended up taking me in like a three-year journey um, of my own sort of like self-discovery. That's what I want to dig. Yeah. Sorry to cut you off. That's exactly what I want to dig into. But just again, to kind of trace the trajectory here for everybody. 
Like it, it seems like this constant sort of rungs of the ladder of difficult experiences, like one after the other, right? And it may be not elevating levels of difficulty, but all those different sort of examples from your past where like whether you knew why you were doing it or how you were doing it, you pushed through, you persevered, took on additional challenges, figured it out, navigated the chaos, all those sorts of things. And then you've got this kind of one moment or at least a, a extensive moment, right? Period of life where that's that's not happening, right? And you described it as potentially depression. You've used language like burnout with me, you know, in the past. Um, and I just I just want to highlight that because we're not talking about, I think, being impervious to anything life throws at us, right? But we are talking about mindsets, attitudes, skills that allow us to then navigate and ideally make the most of or grow from it. Yeah. Right. And that's what I think where you're about to take us on that journey of self-discovery. So I'd love if you just walk us through kind of what that's been like, some of the things that you've learned. And um, because I think you've had these very sort of, I, I did it. And uh, there's this moment in life where I didn't do it. And all of it has taught you a lot about yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Um, honestly, uh, I think that was probably the hardest thing I've ever been through in a lot of ways, because I think in the, in my past, like whatever has happened in my life, I'm able to just figure it out. You know, I just do it. I just figure it out, you know? Um, and, and I think this was the first time where I was genuinely concerned that I would not be able to figure this out. And I didn't know, I just didn't know what it meant for me. Um, and especially I think when your identity is so wrapped up in your achievements, you know, um, for me at that time, I mean, my gosh, I was like a, you know, startup founder, of a successful company, you know, and I, you know, I, I think the idea of, of not being that was, was really scary for me. Like, what am I at that point if I'm not doing that? And so sure. like that it was, you know, it was hard. And so I decided, and it also kind of started, you know, I, I realized too, I was had some bad habits and that were like becoming, you know, without getting too much detail, but it was becoming sure. a bit like dangerous, you know, for myself. Yeah. yeah. And um, so yeah, I had sort of like a wake up moment where I I just knew I had to go get help. And uh, that then I then ended up going to a four day like therapy retreat. I call it therapy camp uh, at onsite. Um, and that was that really was sort of a turning point for me. But the journey after was so much longer and harder than I, than I thought it would be <laughs> because I thought like, I mean, just the first step for me to go to therapy was, was huge because I, I had been through therapy before. I never, it never stuck. I never was able to find a therapist that I liked that I wanted to go to. I hated talking about my past. I never wanted to, I'm like, I don't want to talk about my childhood, you know, like I really, really just did not want to sit there and rehash events from my childhood. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I was very resistant, um, but I did it. And then, you know, I met my therapist there, who's now my therapist, uh, Brendan, who um, in a very skillful, masterful way, like kind of led me on this journey for four days where, you know, I was able to, like sort of see the, the my own patterns for myself. Like I didn't realize how severely codependent I was, you know, I had no idea. I didn't even know what that was, you know? Um, but it made a lot of sense in the way that I grew up. I had a lot of addiction in the house, a lot of chaos um, and, you know, trauma. And so like, I just, you know, now I can have a lot, I have a lot more compassion towards it, but, you know, hearing, hearing, getting myself to that point where I realized that was one of my issues was like really, I mean, confronting. <laughs> and so, you know, after, you know, and of course then you can see the lens through which, you know, you can look at through all your failures in your past, like failed relationships, failed, you know, 
really, I guess, around relationships um, or, you know, even like friendships, work, work stuff. I mean, it, it started to make a lot more sense to me and, you know, how I was, um, you know, what, what I was bringing to a situation. And, but then, you know, after that, I thought, okay, well, now I know I'm good. Like I can just, you know, I, I, I can just bounce. I can just go back. Right. And that's not how it went for me at all. So, so far, and this is important, self-awareness, right. Increased dramatically through consistent therapy with somebody you, you've grown to like and trust. I know you've sp spoken very highly of him. Um, I, I just think this is critical because a lot of things we find or, or try to, I think, mention to people is like, there's not really a, a paint by numbers approach to well-being, to resilience, to flourishing, to thriving, to anti-fragility. It's just not the way it works. It has to be extremely personalized and very bespoke to kind of get the most out of it. And it sounds like you started by addressing that end, kind of, if you will, kind of this break fix model first. And we're going to go into, you know, some of the other things I think you then did and learned and executed. And, but I think just a lot of our listeners will hear this and sometimes they'll think, well, I got to start adding the morning routine and I got to do the cold plunges and I got to have my gratitude journal and med like they add. Right. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like what you did was dig first and try to like understand and identify before just putting a bunch of junk on top of it. Right. Yeah, that's a really great point. Um, because I am certainly guilty of being like hyper obsessive around all the hacks, you know, like, like, I, I mean, sure. give me a good hack, I'm all like, if I can like hack my way out of something like, I, you yeah. know, and I, I really, really wish like that I could have just done. And at that point in time, if, if you, if you would tell me, look, if you just cold plunge every day and like go do some breath work, you're going to be like hundred percent better. And I would have like, just, I mean, I was desperate for, for sure. sure. Um, but I knew, I think I, I think I really understood that, that I had a systemic like problem, you know? And what, what I didn't realize was, you know, if you would have told me before I went to onsite, before I went to my therapy camp, if you would have told me, yeah, this is going to be like a three-year journey for you it's going to take you out of work and it's going to be a whole, like a whole thing. I don't think I would have done it, you know, and, and because it like the amount of work that I've had to do, like to come back has been enormous. Um, and what I didn't realize at that time was that, you know, if you look at codependency, you think about it, it's like, oh, it's like an issue with like your relationships. You know, you sacrifice, you know, you don't really understand your own needs and you're like focused on other people. And then, you know, you get your validation through that other sources. Totally. That makes sense. I mean, I, I can rationally look at that and say, I understand those behaviors. The problem that I didn't realize was that how that issue permeated in all aspects of my life. So it required so much therapy for me to like, you know, because I, one thing I run into a lot with people that are in therapy is they're like, yeah, I went and did the therapy thing and I've like, I'm better now. Well, I kept thinking that like, I'm better now, but then, you know, a new situation would arise. that was totally different, you know, whether it's a friendship, uh, you know, a relationship, um, a parenting issue, like all these like things, right. That are in your life, like something new would crop up and it's, it would be so easy for me to just sort of revert into these like unconscious patterns Sure, that took yeah. a long time of like having to just confront it every fucking time, <laughs> like go to therapy. Yeah. So yeah. I'm, I mean, you know, I'm a huge proponent, like before that I was like, oh, I don't believe in therapy. And now I'm like, man, it, I think it saved my life, you know, in a lot of ways. So let, let's get to the, I think the heart of the matter then I think you just took us there and we'll, we'll start to kind of wrap here a little bit as well. But, um, you know, a lot of our guests we've talked about, or I've asked directly sort of like the one thing, you know, you might do to start whatever, feeling better, being more anti-fragile, like it's the habits and it's the hacks and it's the systems and it's the things like that. But I guess I would frame your question a little differently, which is, 
how did you finally get to a point? And I think you're going to tell me it's an active process, not that you're all of a sudden just done. I figured it out. But how did you get to the point where you felt like you could break some of those either conscious or unconscious sort of habits and loops and routines and and ways of being and shift out to this kind of newer person that eventually pulled you out of that burnout and pulled you out of some of those experiences? What what ultimately changed? It was... um it was little little by little changes in in like in how i you know you and i have worked a lot on um like on the cognitive behavioral therapy side and like the reframing of perspectives and and how to you know like how to maybe not how to question your story around something and that is that is a hard thing to do in practice, but it does require practice. Who has a lot of practice? And, and it was one of those things where it's like what I realized over time, and I can't say there was like one moment where I'm like, oh, I'm better. But it was like one of these things where I just like woke up one day and I was like, oh my gosh, you know, I have a lot more peace in my life. I think before there was just a lot more chaos that I just kind of knew how to thrive in. And so, you know, it, it just like, maybe not thriving by the way. You're right. Right. (laughs) In retrospect, navigating. Yeah. Yeah. Navigating. But I was just sort of used to, and now, and now, you know, with learning about, especially understanding boundaries, like really understanding what boundaries mean. It's not about Mm -hmm. the other, Mm -hmm. it's about you, you know, Mm -hmm. and how your choice to react to something and, you know, what you allow into your life, like, all of that. Um, yeah, I just, one day I just, I mean, it's been recent, pretty recent where I'm like, wow, like all of my relationships are really nurturing and compassionate and mutual, like, you know, it, it, it's like a reciprocal reciprocal. Yeah. I've got really good people around me. Um, I've met amazing people along the way, like yourself you know, um, and Adam <laughs> and, uh, you know, but just the process that I've been through, like, I, I mean, I even got, you know, I got to take a course with Scott Barry Kaufman, um, on self shout out SBK. Yep. We love SBK. Yeah. I mean, it was, fan- it was fantastic. And, and I, I mean, I just did all, I was just doing all these things to try to, to try to help myself, but yeah. you know, I don't think any one of them was like the thing. It was like, sort of like yeah. just overall, like, it just very gradually then like three years later here I am. And I feel like I'm, I'm like a functional adult again, that actually can, you know, go back to work that, that has, that can have healthy relationships that, you know, can take care of herself. Um, you know, integrated. And, yeah. It's a much more integrated way of being. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good way of describing it. It it certainly sounds like a lot of it starts as it often does with like mindset and perspective, you mentioned the story you told yourself, um, kind of reframing some things, even having basic levels of optimism enough to take the class, to talk to the therapist, to learn this, to read that, to try that hack. Like all of that comes fundamentally from a mindset. Yeah. Um, I mean, some of it is you have to fake it in a lot of ways. Like I, I know in the in my codependent stuff that a big function of that is, is like low self-worth. And, and that is, you know, if you, if you don't know that you're that way, or you don't know that you have that, like, it's just the, the lens through which you see the world, Mm -hmm. you know, and that, and it affects kind of everything. And so that like cleaning of the lens and, you know, sort of removing these like layers that were, you know, that just don't make sense anymore. Um, that process has been a really beautiful, like, you know, I can say that now. I didn't, I mean, it was really fucking hard, you know, for <laughs> like very confusing. You know, I just, I didn't even like, I honestly didn't know like where I was going to end up with this. Like I, it just felt like I was just like staring off into space, you know, like, <laughs> like with just no plan other than to try to feel better. Mm-hmm. 
but I think now, you know, I can see it. It's, it really is an integrated way of, of being. And, and, it, and it does start with like the mindset and the perspective and like how you, how you respond to events. Cause you know, you always have a choice, right? Before it felt like it was very, um, very, uh, like unconscious in the way that I was like responding to things. Mm -hmm. And now there, there's a lot, you know, I have, I have a new meditation practice that has now been consistent for a year and spiritual side of it. And like that has really helped me to also like in this process. Increased awareness. Yeah. 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 Awareness, perspective, mindset. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Good. Um, We've got to wrap here, but I, I am curious, you know, we typically ask a question or two just about parenting. And obviously you've got, you know, a, a lovely child that is now, I think, in the first year uh, at an esteemed institution that you're super proud of. But um, aside from gloating about her, <laughs> how how has your experience, if at all, and I have to imagine it has on some level, influenced the way you have parented some of these lessons that you've learned? Yeah. Um... I was very concerned that because my, my daughter was like number two in her class. Like she was just all around, you know, awesome at school. Um, but I was really concerned that my hyper productivity would sort of rub off on her mm -hmm. <laughs> and being like very achievement oriented as like a source of, um, you know, self-worth and so, you know, she, I, we both were in therapy, you know, for several years. Um, and thank God, I mean, she's she seems to be like so well adjusted. She's got lots of a great social network. You know, she's at UCLA, so she's around the corner. Um, she seems to be just like really thriving and confident you know, in herself. And especially because like when she was 12, she came out as, as being gay. And, you know, I think not that that, I mean, it's just, it's just an additional sort of dynamic as a parent, like, you know, raising a gay teen that like you, like the biggest fear is that like, they're going to feel like they're less than for some reason. Hmm. You know, or that, and, and I, and I can honestly say, like, I, I'm so amazed at her, um, like, just at her self concept, like how, like how, um, like she seems really wise for like an 18 year old, and it, and it probably has a lot to do with, you know, just all the stuff that I put her through too. You know, I mean, she, she dealt with like, you know, single parent, like being gone a lot, like she, you know, it was a lot for her. Hard stuff too, which is, yeah. which, which is kind of, part, you know, why we're always asking is I think, you know, uh, not a parent myself, spent a lot of years and a lot of schools and a lot of teams around a lot of families. And there's like, one thing is pretty consistent across the board, which is like most parents want their kids to be happy, but I often find, and I think parents will, will mention it too. Sometimes that like you lose the forest for the trees and you just like have constant pleasantness for them. Yeah. yeah. Right? And so, so part of the themes we've been pulling out in these conversations is like the extent to which a parent might intentionally put their kids into hard things and, and help them learn to navigate certain difficulties and, and be more self-aware and, and talk about those sorts of things. And, and maybe there was some of that with you, but I think what I've heard from your answer that we didn't necessarily hear from others is um, it sounds like you had a really conscious focus on helping her develop an integrated sense of self to use that word we used earlier. Yeah. I mean, I think there is a tendency. I saw a lot, a lot here in my town, like around helicopter parenting. Sure. And I was yeah, like, we both, we both spent a lot of time in that Southern California scene and it's a huge thing. Yeah. yeah. It's a huge yeah. thing. And I was kind of the opposite of that. Um, and I think in a lot of like, you know, she really, I think, did it herself. Not herself. I mean, obviously she had a lot of help, but like I wasn't talking to teachers, you know, I wasn't like, you know, in there arguing for grades. Um, and I room to struggle. Yeah. Yeah. Room and I to think flounder was, a little bit. 
It was really important. And, it, and I, I mean, like, you know, in, in my case, like with my father, like he was extremely harsh, you know, um, but with her, I don't think there was ever a time that like I truly yelled at her or like, you know, was like angry at her for like a choice in school. I mean, she really, I think deep down, you know, like this was her, like she wanted to go to UCLA. She, you know, she has all these like goals and dreams for herself. And just recently she came to me and she said that she's interested in the music industry mm. and she's like writing and producing music and like, and, and I think some parents like, like when like my dad would have flipped out if I came home and said that, you know, and I'm not like, I'm not trying to disparage my father, but like she, I, I'm like, just happy, you know, I'm like, yeah, like go do whatever, you know, it's your mm -hmm. life and we have a great relationship. So, I, you know, I'm just really, really happy, really proud of her. Yeah. Great. Awesome. Well, we got to wrap, but Jackie, thanks for spending the uh, the time with us. I know you're busy and you got a lot of things going and uh, we appreciate you sharing your story and your insight. Oh, thanks, Nick. It's been such, it's been so awesome working with you. Really. Like I've learned so much. Um, so thank you for, for everything. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah. Well, this, this has uh, been fun hanging out and hope the audience enjoys. Thanks so much for listening to Flourish FM. We hope you enjoyed the content. Please be sure to leave us a five-star review and hit that subscribe button wherever you listen to your podcast and on all major social media platforms. And if you visit our website, flourishfmpodcast.com, you can sign up to our newsletter. We send out a weekly newsletter. First newsletter of every month, we share a long-form blog. And every newsletter, every week, we share highlights from our previous episodes. Please hit subscribe on our website.